So hello everyone. So we'll continue again with Damien uh, today for the introductions to parallel computing. So uh, thanks a lot, Damien, and you are live. Thank you, Olivier. So welcome, <coughs> everybody. So the goal of uh, this session is to introduce actually the sessions that will come later about parallel programming and already show you how you can uh, do compute parallel with the base tools from uh, Linux. So we will talk about the generic concepts about how the hardware is able to handle parallel programs. I will mention uh, parallel programming models and then we will see the basic Unix tool or Linux tools which you already can use to have the computer work in parallel. And we will start with uh, general concepts. If you have ever attended a session about uh, parallel programming, you will see that every single lecture about parallel programming asks first the question, why going parallel? And there are three main answers, either to solve one problem faster than when you have only one processor. Uh, it's called speeding up and also called strong, strong scaling. Or you can try to scale up. That means solve a larger problem than uh, the one that you are able to solve with a single processor or scale out a large solve many problems so that even if one problem can be solved with, with one processor, you have too many problems to actually solve all of them with a single processor. So these are the three main reasons to go parallel either to use more processing power or to use more memory and network capacity or to use more storage capacity. Computing in parallel involves two main things. First one is a decomposition of the work. So distributing instructions to processors and distributing data to memories and also collaborations between the workers. So between the processors and there are two types of two types of collaborations that are needed synchronization of the distributed work and the communication of data between the processors. The decomposition of data can be done. The de so the decomposition can be done at two levels, other of the data. It's called data parallelism or at the task level, it's called task parallelism. The data decomposition basically can be either arbitrary like block or cyclic. You see here examples of the decomposition of a vector into uh, uh, blocks which are dispatched to four processors uh, um, identified with colors and you see it can be a block decomposed or cyclically decomposed. You see an example on the left and uh, on the right for the one dimension and you see the examples on two dimensions. You see with either a decomposition of only the lines or only the columns or both either in block or uh, cyclic and you can merge block and cyclic if you want. There's another type of decomposition for data. It's called domain decomposition and there the decomposition of the data is made according to the physics that are being uh, modeled. So here you see an example of um, uh, data that represents a uh, jet engine and the different colors on the mesh uh, represent different uh, parts of the domain <clears throat> and you see that the frontiers of the domain have been carefully chosen to match what is expected uh, from a physics point of view. So in terms of collaboration, there uh, are several types of collaborations and we call about, we, we name synchronous, synchronous uh, collaboration when the uh, synchronization of the task is done at the processor level. So for instance, the same processor instruction is run on e for, uh, by each worker at any time. So that's called uh, 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 SIMD, uh, single instruction multiple data. <clears throat> at the other spectrum, you have embarrassingly parallel when uh, actually the processors do not work together at all. They are completely independent. They work asynchronously. Uh, for instance, when you have large number of files to process uh, and the processing are identical but independent, you are in that setup of what we call the embarrassingly parallel and there is no collaboration at all, just uh, each worker working in, uh, in its own uh, part of the, the job. 
In between, you have fine grain parallelism and coarse grain parallelism, and the uh, distinction between fine and coarse is not uh, a clear cut, but uh, typically when you have the need for communication between the course, the workers at the loop level. So most scientific software include somewhere a loop over some parameter or some data. Uh, if the synchronization is done at the loop level, we typically call that a fine grain parallelism. And if the synchronization is done uh, at a higher level function call level, it's called most of the time coarse grained. One uh, very important notion in parallel programming or parallel computing is the speed up. So the speed up is uh, defined simply as the ratio between the time some problems, some problem takes to be solved with the sequential um, implementation compared with a parallel implementation. And so if this takes uh, four seconds and this takes only one second, you have a four speed up. The efficiency is the ratio between the speed up and the number of workers or processor that you uh, put on the work. And so this reduced to this. So what people are often interested in is this graph, which shows the parallel speed up as a function of the number of processors that you have. And uh, uh, the linear speed up here corresponds to a situation where when you double, for instance, the number of processors, you divide by two the time it takes to solve the problem. You see here a description of the typical success because it's uh, very easy to be linearly, uh, to have a linear speed up when you have a few processors, but uh, the more you add processors, um, the more you add also overhead, and that has a negative impact on the um, the speed up because the thing that you need to realize is that not all the work can be decomposed and actually there's a theoretical result here which is called Anders law um, <clears throat> and it says if you have a part which is non-parallelizable and a part which is parallelizable you can express the maximum speed up you can get as a function of the portion of the code which is parallelized compared to the portion which is not parallelized. And so you see graphs like this that say that basically if you have 95% uh, of the code which can be parallelized, you have the green uh, line here, you see that uh, you can put as many cores as you want when you have reached 2000 cores, you cannot get a better speed up simply because uh, you are bound to the portion of the code which is uh, sequential. Another issue that you can run into when you write parallel program is the actual overhead induced by the collaboration. You see here the code for the hello world in MPI. So there will be two sessions about MPI uh, next week. So you will learn what it means, but basically what it's does is a printf, so you know the printf command, which simply writes something on the screen. And here you have just the function that are needed for this printf to be able to work in parallel on several machines. And here, this old graph is is the what we call the, the core graph of function. So this is all the functions or the parts of the MPI libraries which are called when you run this simple MPI a hello world program. So you see that if you had the equivalent without MPI, a pure sequential, you would have probably two or three boxes, a simple call to the printf uh, library and itself a call to the puts um, kernel uh, uh, feature. But here you see a large number of boxes, meaning that a large number of functions in the code are involved in simply setting up the environment to be able to run this hello world in parallel on several machines. Another thing that is uh, also important to understand is that if you have load imbalance between the workers, if you have a worker that does most of the job while the others are not doing anything, uh, this is a problem when you try to have a good speed up because you are bound by the time taken by the worker that has the most portion of the job to do. 
So all the time when you write part program, you need to think about the balance between the workers and make sure that every worker or every processor needs uh, to have the same amount of um, work to do, for instance. If you attend the open MP session uh, next week or the week after, I don't remember, you will see that open MP offers some uh, tools to guide the imbalance to, to solve the problem of imbalance when you are facing it by uh, dynamically assigning the tasks to the worker. OK, so don't hesitate to ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, if I see questions which are relevant for everybody, I will just read them out and answer them. Uh, I am now going to hardware for parallel computing. So <clears throat> I would just give an overview of where we can find parallel computing capabilities in the hardware that we use. First, at, at the core level. So the core is the smallest unit of computations in the in the computer. And even inside the core, you see here an example of a block scheme um, of a, a core for a Sandy Bridge uh, CPU. And you see that there are here and also here and also here already several possibilities to do uh, arithmetics, for instance, inside the, the, the core. Furthermore, you see that these, these and these actually, and also these and these and these are able to do the same instruction on multiple pieces of data. So there, there is already inside the core itself possibility to do parallel programming, either with single instruction, multiple data, uh, it's called the AVX, AVX extensions and the like, or with instruction level parallelism by just feeding uh, port, for instance, 0 and 1 with data at the same time. Most of the time you won't need to take care of that. It's mostly the job of the compiler. Now, this is how a core can work in parallel, and there are several cores on the same CPU socket or CPU. So here you see a, a dice shot, as we call it, of a multi-core processor, typically the processor that you can have in your laptop and you see that it has four cores that have the same capabilities as the the one that i showed before so on most clusters you have two or even four cpus uh, available in each compute node so you can have two uh, cpus like this or four inside the a single machine alongside with accelerators such as the gpus or the uh, no different uh, uh, Xeon Phi, and there will be sessions about GPUs later in the in the in the fall. So in your computer, you can have multiple CPUs, each having multiple cores, and possibly having uh, accelerators, which even have more cores. And then at the data center level, you have multiple machines inside multiple racks inside multiple rooms possibly. So you see on the picture here, each of those rectangles is a computer with uh, two CPUs and uh, like 20 or more cores, I don't remember. And you see here the back side with all the network and the storage and the switches for the communication. And you see here on the left, an example of the racks in which the computers are hosted. And then you can group together several data centers and you have a, a, a consortium like we have in SESI. So you know if you attended the first session that uh, as a member of any university from the SESI, you have access to all the clusters of the SESI. So actually, this is a way to gather the compute power from multiple um, data centers. And uh, one of the largest example of such collaboration is the, the worldwide LHC computing grid. So it's actually a large number of compute centers which have a large number of CPUs uh, inside them, which are shared in a common infrastructure to be able to work in parallel on a very, very large number of processors. 
There's another way of grouping compute power from several machines. It's called the grid computing, the cloud computing, sorry. Um, and you know probably the names of uh, the well-known examples that are Azure, Microsoft Azure, the Google Cloud Platform, or the Amazon Web Services. These are called public clouds, and here you have examples of private clouds which are uh, installed inside the data center. Also, at the world level, you have projects like City at Home or Fold at Home, where people have uh, created software that is able to use the compute power from a large number of small computers uh, uh, located anywhere in the world. So you can contribute to those projects with your laptop simply by installing the client on your laptop. And then when you are not using your laptop, it will ask for work to do uh, on the project. So you see that parallelism can be done at the uh, core level, at the CPU level, at the node level, at the data center level, or even at the world level. It's all a matter of choosing the good programming model to be able to use different types of parallelism in those different projects. Talking about program programming models i will just list some programming models here uh, just a broad overview it's not the main topic of this talk just to introduce the programming models that you will see uh, in the future so there are several ways different different ways to organize the work uh, one is called task farming is when there is no communication among the workers so it's related to the embarrassingly parallel workloads. And you have in there two distinct types of task farming. Uh, either you have a so-called master that distributes works to the workers, often, uh, and now I know, know more and more often called leader follower, or uh, the other way around where workers pick up tasks from a pool and that's called work stealing. Um, <clears throat> no, the other paradigm when you need collaboration between the workers, so you need synchronization, is called SPMD, so single program multiple data. And in that paradigm, actually, you have a single program that contains both the logic for distributing the work and the computing part. And then uh, that kind of program is run in an environment that creates many instances of the same program and uh, link them together. And typically this is the padding in which OpenMPI and OpenMP are developed. And if you follow the session about MPI or OpenMP, you will hear again this paradigm. And also you have the multiple programs, multiple data paradigm when you, when, uh, you have multiple uh, so, uh, piece of software that work together in parallel and interact together. There are also other types of paradigms, a bit less used, but uh, it's always nice to know about. The pipelining paradigms, where when you have, for instance, here three tasks which depend on each other, uh, you can, if the problem allows it, for instance, uh, have the task A issue um, a part of its results so that task B can already start before the end of uh, all the work that task A has to do and so on to uh, C. So I will show you an example later on, but it's called pipelining. So when the, the process B does not wait for the whole work of process A to be done before starting. Uh, there's also not another paradigm called divide and conquer, uh, where each processes or each worker are spawned at need and report the result to the parents. This is typically how most cloud related technologies work. Uh, if you heard about big data and so on, most of the time they are based on this uh, paradigm. And there is also the speculative parallelism. Uh, so this is a paradigm which is um, <coughs> used a lot at the compute, at the CPU level, so inside the core. Uh, it's much less used in programs um, uh, written by uh, users, but it's something that can be very interesting. And the idea is if you have uh, in your program a branch with, a, for instance, an if 
statement and the computation of the uh, expression in the if statement takes a lot of time, you might want to simply run down through both um, uh, branches, the if and the else branch, on two processors, and then when you have the result for the for the condition, you just discard the the, process, the work of the processor that corresponds to the branch which does not uh, need to be followed. So I see a question, which paradigm would you use for computing the same thing in different points? So the same thing in different points typically is the uh, SPMD paradigm. So single program, so do the same thing, compute the same thing on different points, so it's multiple data. Um, about now the programming models. So uh, Paradigm is a way to organize the work. A programming model is a concrete library or syntax in a compiler that you can use and take advantage of. For a single computer, uh, as I said earlier, you can have a parallelism in the CPUs or in the accelerators. And in the CPU, you can use uh, multiple CPUs at the same, so um, multiple cores uh, at the same time by using either of these uh, technologies. So P threads, OpenMP, TBB, which is thread building box, or OpenACL, OpenCL. So we have here an OpenMP session. Uh, done by Orient Luan um, in a few weeks. If you have GPUs, for instance, you can use either CUDA, OpenCL, or OpenACC. And you see the, that OpenCL is a nice thing that can be used to do parallelism at the CPU level or at the accelerator level. But it's sometimes uh, seen as a bit more complicated to comprehend than CUDA uh, for GPUs. But anyway, there are session about GPUs and OpenSSE and CUDA in the future. So feel free to register and to attend them. Uh, about multi-computer parallelism. So when you have actually a memory which is distributed, you can use uh, MPI. So there's a session about MPI, uh, but that is often um, uh, used on clusters when you have a shared storage. If you do not have a shared storage most of the time, you will use something like MapReduce or things from the big data community. And if you have no storage at all, uh, Boink, which is used in uh, distributed computing, like I talked about SETI at home or FOL at home, this is the library to use when you want to use that kind of resource. And then there are libraries uh, that allow uh, doing shared memory parallelism on multi computers, so they hide away the fact that the memory is distributed on multiple computers. And what you see from a programmer's point of view is simply a single memory. Uh, and so behind the scene, the library takes care of making sure that every piece of data is available for every CPU at a good time, at the correct time. And so you have core arrays in Fortran and you have UPC in uh, C. So this was a bit technical just to introduce uh, the future sessions and uh, but now we can be a bit more concrete and talk about the Linux tools because out of the box Linux already offers uh, tools that are interesting to work in parallel. So here I will start a shell and I will, I'm, you see that I'm here connected to uh, Lemetra 3. So if you want to try the examples along you can connect to Lemetra 3 for instance. But the uh, tools I will be using are very generic, and so you will find them uh, nearly certainly on all cluster or on your laptop, if you have a Linux laptop. So the first thing I will uh, show you is that I'm going to work on uh, an example. And if you look into the CC home, into the CC um, shared storage in the approach, subdirectory in this training you have a bar comp and there you see that you have a large number of files and i will use that those files so feel free to copy them uh, to your uh, home directory so you are able to play with them so this is where you can find them 
in slash cc in capital letters slash pro slash training slash parcomp. So it stands for parallel computing. So here you see what that I have uh, this part here, which is sim simple program. I need to go there. And what this does, it's a simple bash script that I will use to pretend that I'm doing hard work. So what it does, it reads each line of either file or the standard input. It sleeps for one second, just like if it were doing something in, important. And then it will just transform letters from capital to lowercase, so from uppercase to lowercase. And then if you give an argument, which is an output file, uh, it will write to that argument. Otherwise, it will write to std out. So I hope you have been uh, following the Linux session or that you already know about Linux because I will use quite a number of uh, Linux um, um, concepts in the following. So <clears throat> typically, if I have a, pro a file like this one, which simply has one letter per line i can use this program to simply output the same letters in the other case so i can also simply display the file and push it inside through the um, std on std in of uh, lower and it does exactly the same. So it doesn't do anything interesting, except that it will help us uh, observe that things can go in parallel. So I'm sure you know that you can um, uh, chain, chain commands in bash with the colon. So if I take this and I, and I check, 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 check do twice the same thing and I put a colon between both. It will simply do the first command first and then the second command again. Now, if I use the time, command from bash, I can do exactly the same except that at the end, it will give me the time it took. Here it's eight seconds. And it makes sense because the data size is four and we see that we have one second sleep per input in the file. And so uh, we run this twice. So the total amount of seconds spent is uh, eight. So this is simply what I'm showing here. Now, you might heard about the background term, and it simply says that if you put here an ampersand and here also, actually both commands will be sent to the background and they will run in parallel, possibly on multiple cores. The thing is that as they run in parallel, I need to um, use a wait command here to be able to have a correct measurement of the time. Otherwise, being sent in parallel, they will just go to the background. I will show an example here. You see that they worked in the background, so they are actually polluting my uh, prompt. It's finished now, but you see that the result of time was already uh, displayed here, simply because this and this have been uh, put to the background and so time thought it was finished. It's important because the way we submit job on the cluster is very similar to that. And so if you are using that kind of construct on the cluster, you will need to use the wait command here. And you will see that when I do that, it's also working two by two. And at the end, I have a correct reading of the time it took. And you see that it took four seconds. OK, so I know that the work that is done is simply asleep, so it's not a proof that it's in parallel, it's just a proof that it runs concurrently. 
it could be uh, run on the same CPU because the CPU does nothing. But actually, if rather than sleep, you would have something which is CPU intensive, Linux kernel would uh, broadcast the load of the two program on two distinct CPUs and you will actually uh, have the same result. <clears throat> A nice thing to know about is XARC. So here, if you look here, I have I have four files named d1.txt to d4.txt. Uh, if I pipe them in through XRs and I use dash capital L1 or L simply uh, and then echo, you will see oh, you will see that um, what happens is that the output of ls is split into uh, lines par by x arcs and given as argument to the echo command here okay so if i uh, show another example uh, um, if i list all the files it will just list them simply with echo and echo can uh, actually uh, prepend something here just to show you that the output of ls is split by xargs and fed into echo as a supplementary argument so what i can do is rather than running echo i can run my lower program simply like this so what you will see here is that the each of the D1, D2, and so on file is fed by XR into lower.sh as an argument. And so you see the first four ones here are the result of uh, running lower on this file. And the first after the four, the next four are the result of running on this file and so on. And so I have here a bit of time to wait because I have four lines by four and it takes time to do it all. So XRs can be used to split the work uh, that is output by the ls command here and feed it into the lower command. So I will stop it here. OK, it's finished. Uh, so seen like that, it's very interesting. But what is more interesting is that it has another argument. It's called uh, capital P. You see it here. And it allows to do the same thing, but using multiple processes and so also multiple processors. So if I do that, I just replaced, uh, I just added dash capital P four. You see now that it's all being processed four by four. And so as the work is the same, the total time it takes is uh, uh, a fourth. You see here with the time, with the time function, if I'm not using the dash capital P, it takes 16 seconds. But if I'm using it, it's back to four seconds. Actually, the time it takes for uh, one uh, uh, file to be processed simply because I have four files and I use four processes. So now an example with a pipelining. You remember I talked about pipelining and here I have a single file but I have multiple programs. So here I've shown you uh, lower but I also have uh, upper program so lower is on the left it's the one i showed you and here you have upper which does exactly the same thing in the other in the opposite sense in the opposite direction sorry. so it takes uh, lowercase and it puts them in uppercase so if i do something uh, uh, with if i'm doing something which is not interesting just for the sake of illustration i would take a file 
put it, put it to lowercase and then put it back to uppercase. I would do it like this. So uh, for instance, lower d.txt and I will uh, put that in the du.tmp and then I will uh, upper d.tmp. So here I'm not seeing the output of the first part because it's being sent to a file, but I see the output of the, of the second part. Okay. Now, the idea of pipelining is to avoid waiting for this file to be constructed and just link the output of this part to the input of this part. And now you see that, oof, after one second, I already see the output of here. So if I use the time here, you see here using the intermediate, sorry, using the intermediate, intermediate file here, it takes eight seconds because you have one file processed twice with two different uh, programs. And if you are using pipes, which is the name of this element here. It takes five seconds, so it takes actually four seconds. It takes for a full file to be processed, plus one second it takes for the first line of this to be processed. But as soon as the first line of this file is processed by this program, it is fed into this program and processed. So the output takes five seconds. So this relies on the fact that the upper and lower programs are able to use pipes because they are able to take input and write output to pipes and pipes are a specific functionality of Linux and Unix. So if you have program which is not able to um, write to a pipe, so to uh, the standard input of another program, you can use what Linux calls FIFO. So here I will do the same as before with my uh, d.tmp file, except that I will uh, remove it and I will make it a FIFO file. So this is a kind of file which is very special and it allows me to work with a file uh, as if it were a um, uh, pipe. So here I put the ampersand just to make sure that both commands can run in parallel. And you see that already I have the result of the first line that comes after one second and not after uh, four seconds if it were not in parallel. So if you have a program that is able to use the standard input and output, you can simply use the pipes. Otherwise, you can use an MK FIFO file, a FIFO file, uh, just to uh, simulate uh, something that uh, looks like a pipe. And it has the same functionality as a pipe, so as soon as data comes in, it can be read by another process and uh, consumed. <coughs> so we have seen how to work with multiple uh, files, also how to work with multiple uh, programs. And here I'm showing you how to work with a single large file. And here I'm going to use the split command. So uh, we will pretend that this file, uh, that um, this file is a large file and we will uh, use the split command with the, the arguments which are here. Um, so the first one is just to avoid buffering because buffering is very interesting when you have a large file, but when you have a small example like this, you don't want buffering uh, just to illustrate the fact that it will run in parallel. And then dash dash number R divided by four, it's instructing split to split the, the file into four parts in a round-robin fashion. 
and then um, I will just use the dash dash filter and lower dot sh. Uh, yeah, it's not open, it's open from the foot. And, okay. And the Okay, so here it complained that it didn't find the lower command because I forgot to add the dot slash here. And so you see, they all appear at once simply because the lower program has been launched four times by the split program and each time it has fed it with one line of this file. So if you have a very large file, that you need to process and the processing of each line is independent one of another, you can use uh, simply the split command to split the large file and have it processed by uh, multiple instances of the same program. Sorry, and so here you see an example with, uh, with time. So the time it takes without using split The time it takes without using split uh, is uh, four seconds, as we expect, and the time it takes using split is only one second. Like here. And here you see uh, some trick I used to show that actually behind the scenes, you have four instances of uh, lower to uh, that have been started by the split command. Okay, so this is another example where we have both multiple files and uh, multiple uh, uh, processes. So we have lower and upper and we have uh, multiple files. So if I come back here, we have four files, we have upper and lower and we have what we call a make file. And a make file is a file where you describe how to compute things. So here, what he says on this line, he says that I want to create a file named d1.res, another d2.res, d3.res, d4.res, and so on. And how are they computed? By using the rules which are described here. So we have a rule that says that anything that ends with that .res is created from the same, the file which has the same name, except that it's not that .res but .tmp and the upper command. And you use it, the upper command like this, and these are just placeholders to uh, refer to the .res and .tmp file. And you have the same here. You see that a .tmp file is created from a .txt file with a lower uh, program. So having described that, uh, I can simply issue the make command. So it's, it's exactly the same command that you use when you want to compile um, a program that you from that you downloaded and you have the source code and you need to compile it to a binary. Uh, make file was designed at the beginning to create binaries from source code, but actually you can use it to launch your process to do a computation. And so you see that uh, here, it first runs lower on d1.txt to produce d1.tmp and then upper on d1.tmp to produce d1.res. And then it does iteratively the same on d2. It will do the same on d3 and then uh, on d4. So it takes a bit of time. Here it will take around 32 seconds because we have four files uh, with uh, four lines each and we have two programs uh, to run and every uh, uh, every uh, I, every line takes one second to be processed okay so now it has uh, created all the res files that's nice but what is really nice is that just like xarcs make as an argument to run in parallel. So if I uh, show you here, you see it takes uh, 30 tickets, 32 seconds as expected. So now I will uh, remove 
the res and also the TMP files. And then I can run make again. Uh, but then with dash GA4. And you see that already the four files are processed, are processed at the same time. And then the four uh, temporary files are processed also at the same time. And you see here the example, sorry, where it uh, takes less time. My computer is acting weirdly. So I will let it cool down a bit. I see a, a question is, why do you use R um, forward slash four instead of P4? Uh, because a split, the ID is to uh, split the, the file. And so the, the, the R divided by four is to say to split, okay, take the first line, uh, give it to the first instance that you start of uh, uh, the program. The second line goes to the second file, the second instance and so on. And then the fifth line in the file goes to the uh, first instance of the program and so on. So in a round robin fashion. And you can also uh, not use R divided by four and say, okay, the first uh, a uh, quarter of the file is fed to one instance and then the second quarter to another instance and so on. OK, so back to make, you see that if I use uh, make dash J4 without the need for further uh, thinking about it, make will run in parallel what it can run in parallel. So uh, if uh, there are dependencies that prevent it from running in parallel, then it will not run in parallel. But here, the way that the dependencies are built, uh, you see that the first, fourth files can be treated in parallel, and then the, the, the four temporary files can be also treated in parallel. So in summary, if you have one very large file to process, you can use the split command to split it in multiple parts and send it to multiple instances of the same program that will run on distinct uh, CPUs. If you have uh, one very large file with several programs, you can use pipes or five for files to actually have the multiple programs work in parallel and make sure that the first one outputs uh, part of the result to the second one before it has finished everything. And if you have many files to project to process, sorry, you can use Xargs if you only have one program to just distribute every files to multiple instances of uh, uh, the program that you want to run. And if you have multiple program, you can use Make, but it's one of the examples. Uh, there are others, but Make is a very simple one to, to process where you can uh, specify the dependencies between the data and describe how a file can be created from another file using a certain command. And all of these uh, tools, which are based uh, from Linux, uh, have an argument that I you to say, OK, I want to run in parallel and I want to use multiple cores or multiple CPUs in my, program, in my uh, computer to work faster. So everything I described here uh, was about simply using the commands that are already present in any Linux machine. But there's another command which is very handy. It's called the GNU parallel. It's a bit more complicated to use, but actually that command on its own can do everything that I just shown you with uh, split, with XRs and so on. So <clears throat> I'm back to limit three here. Um, I don't remember which module I have loaded and I see you see that I have loaded the parallel module here. So the parallel command that I use is the one uh, which I intended to use. Okay. Be aware that if you do not load that module, you might end up with a very old version of the program that is installed 
uh, by default. But here I suggest that you look for a parallel module in, um, in the modules and load the most recent one that you find. Uh, how it works? Typically, uh, you can use it like this. This is to run uh, echo command in parallel, and then with this you can say one, two, three, four, for instance, and it will run one, two, three, four in parallel. So you can also do simply uh, what we just did, lower on the one dot txt, the two dot txt, and so on. And I will not uh, write it by hand. I will just do it like this. It takes some time to start, but then at the end, it all appears at once. And you see that every file, so D, uh, this is uh, the set of the four files, and they all appear at once because Parallel has created as many instances of, of, as, uh, of that program as there are files here. So the nice thing about the placeholder is that you can uh, do uh, interesting stuff about uh, uh, with it. So for instance, if I uh, take this back with echo and I use <clears throat> so it lists the full uh, files and actually if I do this, I refer to the uh, file. So if I do this, it will write the file inside this uh, that I put here. And the nice thing is that you can use a construct like this to uh, replace on the fly the name of the file. So you can have something like this. It's very interesting if you want to um, to do something like this, for instance, lower so I would just echo it so you can see what it does. So if I remove the echo, it will just run these four lines. So Chuk, chuk. There you have. So there's a question. I would like to run the same Python script a few times with different arguments. How do I write it? So uh, if you have the same Python script, let's say, uh, okay, I will with a parallel here, you would do something like this, and then um, here you can have, for instance, and it will run the my script program in python 10 times with uh, va values 1 to 10 so if i run echo devant uh, before it so you can see what it would do it will run all this in parallel um, parallel also has your the uh, possibility of having several arguments. So if I run uh, this, you see that it starts Python uh, script here with every combination of every, every element from this list and every element from that list. And again, uh, it will all work in parallel if you let it do. The more um, processes you create, the more you need to be sure that you are not creating more processes than uh, there are cores on the computer. So uh, um, uh, luckily, uh, parallel has an option to limit the number of cores that you will use uh, so that you don't overload the computers. But you see that you can create very uh, uh, instantly a large number of instances of the program with different parameters. You can also um, use dash dash x apply if you don't uh, want the cross product, but simply to have the first one of the first list with the first one of the second list. So if you see here, I have one A, so one A, and then 2b, 3c, 4d, and then 5, because here it continues, but here I only have 4, and then it cycles back to a. 
So it's very powerful in terms of generating a large number of um, uh, spawn of uh, processes. And if you have multiple here, you can refer to them with a number like this. So you see that it created some name file based on the values here, and which are placeholders for the first set of uh, arguments here. And this one is a placeholder for the second set of arguments here. <clears throat> you saw that here I'm using uh, three columns, but um, there's also the possibility to use four columns, sorry, here, and uh, that is when the uh, set of parameters you want to use is in, in the file. So here you see an example, an example where I have a CSV file, so the files that you can create with the Excel, for instance, and it has a specific combination of number and letters, even with a heading. Uh, actually, Parallel has options such as colon separator and header to parse this file. And uh, then use the same placeholders with the name of the clients. And so if you uh, run simply echo, uh, it will simply run the echo command on each combination that is in the file here. So it's very nice when you have a large number of experiments, but you don't want all the, the cross product of all possible values of arguments, uh, but sim simply some specific pairs or simply some specific triplets. You can uh, store them in an Excel uh, CSV file and then use a uh, new parallel to run your program on every uh, line uh, described in the file. So, uh, there are other interesting options. Uh, for instance, one is dash dash pipe, which allows splitting a file exactly like uh, Xargs, uh, uh, sorry, like a split is able to do. Uh, it has also a dash capital S option that which allow you to use a remote servers through SSH. So if you have data on your laptop, but you have access to distinct machines, not clusters, but uh, uh, single machines. You can use a capital S option to say to uh, Parallel, OK, I want you to run this command on that data in Parallel, but you um, have access to you to those uh, remote computers. So take care of uh, sending the data over there, running the program, the program on the remote machine and then copy the result back. So uh, new Parallel is very efficient. Uh, very nice to do that, uh, but on the cluster it will work a bit differently and you will see that in the slum session. As I said, you have the uh, uh, possibility to, sorry, to uh, limit the number of jobs as, they, as uh, it's scored in the parallel, uh, to make sure not to overload the, the, the compute nodes. Also, something interesting is the dash K option, which is to uh, keep the same order because you know that when you work in parallel, uh, you cannot decide the order in which the job is done. And so if you want to keep the order, you can use dash K. So uh, simply GNU, uh, par the program GNU Parallel will keep in memory the output of every uh, worker and just sort the output at the end so that it fits the output, the order of the inputs. Also, you can use a dash dash delay option to, uh, to uh, make sure that they do not all start at the same time. For instance, it's important if you have a program that reads a file from the, from the disk, you don't want them to all start at the same time because they, they will uh, fight for access to the disk, there will be contention and actually you will lose more time than if you uh, specify a small delay here to make sure that they do not start at the same time. And also something interesting is uh, dash dash timeout, 
just to, till, to kill a task after n seconds if it is still running. So if you have processes that might not converge or something like that, and, or you have the risk of entering an infinite loop, it's interesting to have a sort of job management built in there. One thing that is very important is that the author asks to be cited. So uh, here is the citation you must use if at any point you publish uh, results which have been uh, gathered thanks to uh, the GNU Parallel uh, tool. Okay, so about, uh, it's all I wanted to talk to you about the uh, GNU Parallel. If you want to play with it, I suggest as a homework that you try to reproduce the examples from the previous slides with uh, lower and upper using new parallel. So as I said, new parallel is able to do exactly the same thing as the uh, tools I showed, so uh, split XRs and so on. Uh, so you can try to find uh, the solution. And actually the solutions are in the, in the slides here. So if you download them from the the Indico website, you can find the solutions here. OK, thank you for your attention. I will see if there are any more questions coming, but I think we can say goodbye right now. There is one question that exists there, actually. I want to take a look. I didn't publish it yet. <laughs> <laughs>